This is going to be gases, liquids, and solids. You're probably wondering, haven't we covered that already? <laughs> we talked about gases and liquids and solids early on. But we sort of set that aside for a while. And now we're going to look at them in more depth. All right, so lots of depth, <laughs> 13 sections. I'm gonna, What I'm going to try to do is, I think we've got enough time. I may be able to get through Chapter 7, all the way through Chapter 7. And that way, it would kind of free us up for um, next week and the week after when we do have labs. Then we won't be so pressed. So if we can get through Chapter 7 today, that would be great. All right. All right. This is more or less a review, but if it's new to you, so much, whatever the case, common physical properties of matter. Right. When we characterize matter, um, we're looking at uh, what shape does it have? Does it have a shape? I mean, does it have to assume the shape of its container? Um, does it have a definite volume or will it just expand? forever and i'm thinking of gases what's the density right. we can compare densities of uh different phases of the same material and the density tends to go down as we go from solid liquid to gas that's not always the case but in most cases it happens compressibility right. what compressibility means is can you put pressure on the mass and make it shrink in size? Right? Gases, that's obvious. That's easy to do. Uh, liquids are considered incompressible, but we know that's not true. Right? If you put enough pressure on water, its density will increase. It will, it will occupy a lesser volume. We know that because samples Measurements have been taken uh, at depths in the ocean of a mile, two miles down. And we know that water density at those depths is higher than it is at the surface. Solids, on the other hand, we can pretty much consider a solid incompressible. Uh, thermal expansion. Right? When you heat something up, does it expand? Think of it this way. Um, all those molecules bouncing around. And if you heat them up, what are you doing? You're adding kinetic energy to them. They're, they're moving faster. They've got more energy per molecule. So when they slam into each other, they bounce off with more energy. Right? They retain their energy uh, during the collision. And if you increase that amount, then they're putting more pressure on the outside, the, the boundaries of the substance. Uh, some, if it's a container, right, or if it's just the the edge of the substance. Like I think back to my childhood when um, uh, railroads ran through the town, right? We'd we'd run out every time a train came through and run out, and watch it go by, and try to count the number of cars. But later, I wondered about the tracks. You know, um, why do you hear this clickety clack? It's because that you have separate uh, rails that are bolted together. And you, when you go look at them, there's a gap between each one. And the gap is bigger in the winter than it is in the summer. So that's an, an engineering accommodation for expansion, linear expansion. When those rails heat up, then they're going to expand and close the gap. Um, now they make uh, railroad um, rails that are a mile long. They've formulated the steel so that it doesn't expand with heat very much. So they can make a long, continuous rail um, before they have to put an expansion joint in. Or if you walk uh, sidewalks, right? you walk concrete sidewalks. What do you see in those concrete sidewalks? You see lines in them, don't you? 
about every five feet, you got a line. Well, there are two types of lines. Some of them are filled with uh, putty. It looks like putty. It's a silicon-based uh, adhesive that just fills in the crack. Those are expansion joints so that that slab of concrete can heat up in the summer and close that gap. And if you if it's a really hot day, you can go out there and find that um, that filler is kind of bowed up like that because it's getting compressed. The other joints, uh, they just draw a line. Those are contraction joints. So if it gets really cold and the concrete contracts, then it's got a place that uh, a uniform break. So you got two types of joints there, but they both are based upon the concept of thermal expansion or contraction, as the case may be. Now, in physics and chemistry, we say expansion in a positive way or expansion in a negative way. All right. So there's compressibility. What you're going to see with compressibility is a change in volume. If the substance is under pressure. Thermal expansion, we talked about that already. You need a temperature change for thermal expansion. Now, thermal expansion can be measured in a linear, right? And there's a coefficient associated with it. Uh, there's a formula that goes with it, but we're not going to worry with that. Um, it can be a linear expansion. It can be an area expansion. Like if you if you put a coin on a on a on your stove and turn on the heat, then the coin will expand in two directions. Actually, expands in three. So there's three dimensional expansion also, but it's all due to that internal kinetic energy that you're giving to the molecules. They're banging against each other harder. They push apart further. All right. So when we talk about the different states of matter, they we can characterize them with those properties that we just discussed. Uh, the solid state, uh, in terms of volume and shape, has a definite volume and a definite shape. Okay. Liquids have a definite volume, more or less, but not a definite shape. They need a container. Gases have an indefinite volume and an indefinite shape. In other words, a gas has to be contained three-dimensionally in some type of, of container, a balloon. Um, if it's a, if you're trapping a gas for a reaction, it might be in a one of those round bottom flasks like you see over on that device against the wall. Um, but gases have to be completely contained. Right? If you If you don't, stopper the flask, the gas will escape escape and mix with whatever else. If it's into a vacuum, it'll just keep going. Uh, if it's into uh, uh, a room, right, it'll expand and diffuse through until it reaches the other side. And if it has an odor, you can smell it over there on the other side. Some gases are faster than others. Right? Uh, there are some perfumes, you know, that... Um, when someone walks into the room with perfume, you can smell it almost instantly. Um, other smells don't travel as far. But those that's a nature of a gas. How about density? Well, I mentioned that earlier. Solids generally have the higher density of the, of the material. If you melt it into a liquid, the density decreases. Why? Because the volume increases. Right? We look at our formula. Density equals mass divided by volume. So if you've got a phase change, the mass is constant. So if, if the volume increases from solid to liquid, right, if, we increase, if the volume increases, volume increases, what does that do to the density? Right. If this gets bigger, that has to get smaller. Oh, you can rearrange it. Yeah. Volume equals mass over density. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a, it's just an algebraic expression. You can manipulate it the same way you do any other mathematical equation. 
Uh, how about uh, gases in density? They generally have very low density. When we express density of a solid, it's usually in terms of, if you look it up in a reference manual, it'll be in terms of grams per cubic centimeter. You look up a liquid, this is for solids. If you look up the liquid, it's going to be in grams per milliliter. Right? So what do these have in common? The numbers are exactly the same. If you know that number, you know this number. Okay, because cubic centimeters and milliliters are equal and the same. On the other hand, when you're expressing the density of a gas, it's so tenuous that you need a large volume to get a measurable mass. So we generally express, and if you look it up in a manual, a gas is going to be expressed as grams per uh, cubic meters. Okay, compressibility. Well, it says solid state. You can compress a solid. It's really difficult. You've got to put it under extreme pressure. Like, have you ever seen um, pictures of those devices where they make industrial diamonds? Right. It, 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 they used to be really cruddy. Right? They come out yellow. But that was fine if you were going to embed them in a, in a drill bit. It was okay. But if you're going to make gem quality, then you need to take more care. But they put uh, carbon in this device. They call it a, a an anvil. And it, it takes this huge, huge mass and lots of force, and it focuses it down to a really small, so the pressure is enormous. And they make diamonds that way. They can make other gemstones, too. In fact, they can take the ashes of a relative and make a diamond out of it. Some people do that. I don't see the point, but it can be done. Yeah, it has the carbon. And the it has other things in it, too. So it's not really a pure diamond. It's going to come out with uh, your dear departed special color. <laughs> yep. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yep. Yep. Yeah, the, 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 the pressure on it is they're trying to simulate the pressure that natural diamonds experienced deep in the earth when they were first made. But they have wait, wait. I mean, you've got to be miles deep to get that kind of pressure in nature. <clears throat> so um, solids, I consider them incompressible. Uh, this says that there's there's small compressibility. Liquids are a little bit more compressible. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, gases uh, have very large compressibility. In other words, you can change your volume with a little bit of pressure. We've done the, we've done Boyle's Law in here yet. That's coming. I think that's coming. Yeah. Okay. We're going to do Boyle's Law and that's, we're going to compress a gas and measure the volume change. Right. So we can do it without a huge anvil. We just need a tire pump. Thermal expansion. Solids typically have very small thermal expansions. But if you have a, a rail, on the uh, railroad that's a certain length, then that uh, percent change adds up over a certain distance. Liquid states generally have um, small thermal expansions, but it's measurable. Uh, gases have uh, moderate thermal expansions. In other words, when you heat them up, they will expand. And when we have we talked about that, Charles Law? Have we talked about gas laws yet? That must be this chapter. Okay, we'll get there. Oops, too far. There we go. So what I was describing to you earlier with those molecules that were, were 
acquiring more energy as we heat them. That's part of the kinetic molecular theory. Okay, <clears throat> the kinetic molecular theory started off with gases because it was it was easier to to deal with the mechanics, but it's since been expanded to encompass all forms of matter because it works so well with gases. We've applied it to everything. Uh, the first um, postulate we said we call it. The first postulate of this theory is that matter is composed of tiny particles. Right? They're molecular in nature. They could be atomic in nature. Right? Instead of making the, the name so long we can't write it on the board, we just stopped at molecular. So they're, they're small particles, and there are lots of them. atoms, molecules, ions, anything's fair but there are lots of them. They have um, definite characteristics of size and that, that and they do not change. For the individual atoms, no matter what you do to them uh, in, in the physical realm or chemical realm, it doesn't change them. You've got to go nuclear before you can change an atom, right? And we're not going there, right? So lots of tiny particles. Um, large numbers of tiny particles. All right. Second, these particles are in constant random motion. The only time they're not in motion is at absolute zero. So that means they're always in motion because we've never made it to absolute zero, at least not with large numbers of particles. Some research teams have claimed that they've reached absolute zero um, using lasers, right? And the, they, they track a particle coming at them and they hit it with a laser just the right energy. It, it stops. That's technically at absolute zero for that particle. But... Yeah, right. <laughs> so it doesn't fit our scenario. Uh, and each one of these particles has kinetic energy, random motion and kinetic energy, which can be calculated. All you need to know is the mass of the particle and its velocity. You can calculate its energy. It's kinetic energy. Kinetic always means motion, something moving to be kinetic. <clears throat> Now, that's why we say random. Because even our largest, most powerful supercomputers cannot track every particle and tell you what its energy is. Not in real time. They might be able to simulate it. but So we have to assume random motion. We can't say where everything's going and who's hitting who and the results of the collisions. So we say random motion, and we treat everything statistically. So we say, what's the probability of something happening? Or what's the average value? Does anybody have statistics in here? Yeah, so you get, you get the deal. You calculate the mean, you calculate standard deviation, you can uh, draw a, a distribution of particles, like some of them are like in the middle like with this energy, and then a few of them are over here and a few of them over there. You get the idea. It's, it's a statistical treatment because we don't know individual movement. All right, three. Um, these particles interact with one another. Interactive. What does that do? Well, it transfers energy. Right? They they attract one another. They repel one another. Except 
on an ideal basis, we start off assuming that all the particles act like billiard balls. Right? When they hit each other, they just go bounce off. No attraction, no repulsion. Then we later on, we tweak our understanding with the facts of the matter. Because some molecules do attract, some do repel. And in fact, the higher their kinetic energy, the less of, the less of an influence those attractions have on the overall behavior of matter. Right? Because if you've got high energy, right, they're not around very long. They're coming in pretty fast and they just bounce off. Plus the energy of the impact is orders of magnitude greater than any attractive forces. The only time attractive forces become significant is when you start to cool them down and compress them. And with cooling, you reduce their kinetic energy, then the attractive forces start to take over. And that's an explanation actually for uh, condensation of a, of a gas to a liquid or further uh, fusion going from a liquid to a solid. So if we condense water vapor on a cold pipe, or you see sweating on, on your glass, this one's not gonna sweat because that's a, it's an evacuated it's a thermos bottle. But if I had a, I'd have a glass out here with ice in it, it would start to sweat on the outside because the energy is being removed from vapor in the air and that, that water vapor in the air is condensing. We're removing heat, we're removing energy. So those attractive forces can take over and change from a vapor to a liquid. So we get different types of um, interactions. Um, we can express them in terms of potential energy. That's stored energy. Whenever we say potential, it means we can't grab it yet. Right. Potential energy, stored energy, and it comes in different forms. Uh, potential energy can be, and we usually abbreviate it, PE, like KE, kinetic energy, potential energy. It can be uh, relative to position. Right? My potential energy is a certain amount here relative to the surface of the earth because I'm on the second floor. If I got on the roof, I'd have more potential energy relative to the surface of the Earth. So the higher you go in a gravitational field, the more energy is stored in, in your position. And if I, I want to get that energy back, if I want to convert that potential energy into kinetic energy, motion, all I have to do is jump off the roof. And right before I hit the ground, like right here, I have all that energy back as motion, energy of motion. Of course, when I hit the ground, it converts back into uh, potential energy, like broken bones and, and heat and uh, concussion, and that kind of stuff, popped eyeballs, whatever. It depends on how you land. But that's potential energy of position, and you always need a gravitational field in order to uh, calculate that or express that. Um, you can have potential energy of... Um, well, heat is considered, considered uh, that's where it gets kind of dicey. Um, we know heat is due to kinetic energy of particles, but sometimes kinetic energy uh, of that nature, heat, is considered uh, thermal potential energy. So we're not gonna we're not gonna muddy the waters with that one. I just threw it in for giggles. But as far as we're concerned in chemistry, potential energy is stored in the bonds between atoms. Sometimes it's, it's a lot of potential energy. Sometimes it's not much, but there's stored energy in chemical bonds. Um, nitroglycerin, right? there's a, a lot of stored energy in nitroglycerin in those bonds. All you have to do with nitroglycerin is just uh, look at it cross-eyed and it'll explode. It'll release all that energy. Others have much lower energy. Um, some of these particles will interact uh, according to their, actually, electrostatic interactions are the norm for molecular interactions. 
Um, they can be various types. I mean, if you have ions, uh, you have uh, sodium ions, and that's all you have in the container, then they're going to be repelling each other because right? it's all positives. But if you have some negative ions in there, right, and this is a gas, right, you've got gaseous chlorides, they're going to be attracting one another. Um, but you can also have, instead of complete charges, you can have partial charges. Did we talked about dipoles earlier. Have we covered that? I don't see any nodding yet, so I guess we didn't. You can have molecules that are only slightly negative or slightly positive on one side or the other. Right? They don't have to be full charges like transfer of electrons. Uh, water's a good example. Right? Water's like this, like that. Right? H2O. Okay? It's a bent molecule. We did talk about that, I know. And it's got these... Uh, electron pairs there. So the bond itself is going to have a dipole that way and that way. I know we talked about this. Overall, then, the dipole is like that. So this side of the molecule is slightly negative, and this side of the molecule is slightly positive. That's what that little delta means, only slightly. Uh, let's see. Let's balance it out with the two there. That way, when they interact with one another, when a water molecule approaches another water molecule, if they're oriented so that their hydrogens are facing each other, they'll repel. If they're oriented so that their negatives are facing the oxygens facing the hydrogen, then they'll attract. So you still get those um, interactions. And there's another one that we we really don't want to get into yet. We might eventually. Um, but there, these are permanent, permanent charges, permanent dipoles. They're also temporary, right? They come and go. So we'll only talk about those if it's in the, in the method, in the, uh, slides. Um, so this kinetic energy here. can be, ha, has a relationship to temperature. When we measure the temperature of a substance in whatever scale you want to use, Fahrenheit, Celsius, Kelvin, whatever, there's another one, Rankin. What you're doing is you're expressing the average kinetic energy of the particles in that substance. So if the temperature goes up, the average kinetic energy is going up, right? That's that's what temperature means on a molecular scale. <clears throat> I mentioned this one earlier. Uh, when they collide with one another, these this random motion, when they collide, we start off considering them as completely elastic. Does you know what elastic means? Anybody have physics in here? No. An elastic collision is one in which all of the kinetic energy, the energy of motion, is retained in the interaction. Now, if two equal masses collide with one another with equal velocities and they're head on, then they'll bounce straight back and they'll have the same velocities they came in with, only in opposite directions. And they won't lose any of that energy to any other forms. It'll all be kinetic. That's a 100% elastic collision. Think billiard balls. And that's how we treat these particles in this theory until we have to modify. Okay. Now, here's the way that we can think about uh, using this theory. We can think about these different phases. I erased part of it. Let me fix that. The way that we can think about uh, solids, liquids, and gases is a balance or competition, if you will, between their kinetic energies and their potential energies. 
think of a kinetic energy of the particle is a disruptive force. And I mentioned that earlier, right? When they bang into each other, if there's more kinetic energy in that bang, then they're less likely to stick together. If there's any attraction at all, the faster they're moving, the less likely they are to stick together. That's a disruptive force. Potential energy, on the other hand, is a cohesive force. It tends to hold things together. <clears throat> All right. So when we think of those two types of energy that are possible for matter, kinetic and potential, this is the way the authors of this particular textbook are trying to explain phase changes. For solids, we know that the, for a solid, the physical state is characterized by definite volume and definite shape. Those two. In this case, solids are more ordered than liquids, more ordered than gases. Cohesive forces tend to dominate. Those that hold things together in more regular shape, more regular order, where we have um, the potential energy is much greater than the kinetic energy. That's what's holding them together. Now, while they're while they're in this situation, while they're while they are solids, these particles are gathered together as solids. Um, they still vibrate. Uh, you can't help that. There's always some type of motion, and they they vibrate, but they vibrate within their own little pocket and they don't move out of that pocket that's why you have a definite shape now for liquids they can move out of that pocket uh let's see we are talked about this strong cohesive forces hold the particles essentially in fixed positions okay so this is the cohesive dominates over the disruptive. All right. Um, oh, I see what they're doing. They're trying to explain these different characteristics. Right. The strong cohesive forces hold the particles essentially in fixed positions, which gives them definite shape and definite volume. Their high density is due to the fact that the particles are close together. Right? That decreases the volume and uh, for a given mass. Remember, density is an intensive property. So it's a ratio of mass to volume. And if we hold one of them constant, we hold mass constant, then any change in volume will change the density. So this high density is due to the, the particles being close together and the spacing between them is small relative to their size. This compressibility has to do with the fact that they are held together with very little space between them. You can think of it as empty space. If there's a lot of empty space, when you push on them, then they've got room to move closer together. But solids don't have that. So that's why they're almost incompressible. Thermal expansion. When we increase the temperature, you can increase their vibrations. Right? You increase vibrational kinetic energy uh, disruptive because they are moving. They're moving like this, like this, like that. Some of them actually, the, the bonds are stretching and, and rotating, flopping. So if you cause more vibration, um, then this disruptive force starts to make them push each other apart. And that would cause them to expand. But they're, since they're very so very close together and they're not actually moving out of position, then you don't get a large change in volume. Right? So their, their thermal expansion is very low. 
Liquids, on the other hand, have uh, a definite volume. but an indefinite shape. As far as the, the rate, the balance here between uh, potential energy and kinetic energy, they're about equal. So the cohesive forces and the disruptive forces are pretty much balanced in the middle. Um, the particles are still close together, but they're very, they're free to move. Right? There's a little bit more space between them. So, and they can, they can move. And because the disruptive forces here are about equal to the, the cohesive forces, then they have a chance to move past one another. But they've got enough kinetic energy so that it partially overcomes those cohesive forces and they can move past. That's why they don't have a definite shape. They still have a definite volume, but not a definite shape. All right. So these attractive forces are strong enough to restrict the particles movement within a definite volume. Right? That, that's, that accounts for the definite volume. But the forces are not strong enough to keep the particles locked in position as they would be in a solid. And we've done that by adding energy, right? We add enough kinetic energy so that it balances the potential energy. And now we've got a liquid instead of a solid. They still have relatively high density because um, they're packed close together. They can still move past one another, but they're still in close proximity, so the volume hasn't changed that much. So the density of a liquid typically uh, decreases relative to its solid form. Now there's one notable exception. You know which one that is? I just drew it on the board. Water. When water goes from solid to liquid, the density increases. So the solid is less dense than the liquid. That's why ice floats on the surface of a lake or a river. And that has to do with the way it structures the solid. For water, the structure of a solid is, right, uh, for the liquid, right, the water molecules are relatively close together to one another, and they slide past one another. But when we form the solid, then the molecules arrange themselves in a hexagonal shape. That's why snowflakes have six points. And we've added a bunch of volume in here when they do that. Okay. So when we add volume, the density goes down for the solid. Now, that's not the normal way. Uh, most solids, when they go from solid to liquid, their density decreases. Water's different. And it's good for us that it does. They still have small compressibility, um, maybe a little bit more compressible than solids. But still, it's very small. they have a reasonably small thermal expansion. And so if you if you heat a liquid up, depending on which liquid it is, if you heat it up, its volume is going to increase and it's going to expand. And that's why when we make um, solutions, when we dissolve things in, in water, for instance, and we want it to be a certain concentration, we want to be sure that the temperature of the solution is as close to the calibrated volume for that device, right? If you have a volumetric flask, right, it's calibrated at that to be a certain volume. And if you put a liquid in there 
and you put a solid with it and it's an exothermic reaction and the, the liquid heats up, then it's going to expand. Right? So if you, if you fill it up to here, right, to the mark, uh, and it's hot, then when it cools down to room temperature or the temperature for, of calibration, then it's going to be down here. That's not a problem right, because it just adds more liquid. But if it's endothermic, right, it gets cold, then you think it's here when it's actually cold, and then when it warms to room temperature, it's up here. Now you're screwed. Right? <laughs> you only have one choice. I you have two choices. You can remake the solution, or you can you can you know, stick a uh, pipette in there with a flow of nitrogen gas and hope that some of the liquid will evaporate and bring it back down. I've done that when I was desperate. <laughs> <clears throat> and when the materials that I put in there are very costly, then you try, you try to compensate. But the best thing to do is just don't make that mistake. Right? Just fill it up to here. And then wait for it to come to room temperature and then fill up the rest of the way, just a tiny amount, and you're good to go. All right, so uh, liquids do have a thermal expansion. It's just very small. All right, gases. When we talk about gases in these terms, gases have an indefinite volume and an indefinite shape. So what that means in terms of our discussion here is that uh, potential energy now is much less than kinetic energy. The disruptive forces are dominant in a gas. In other words, it's got a lot of kinetic energy. Those gas molecules are very far apart and they're moving with, with high speed. Right. Some of them are, are faster than the speed of sound. Much faster. Okay. Attractive forces among the particles are very weak. Are, they're almost zero. And because that those attractive forces are insignificant, that's why early scientists in the early to mid-17th century started working with gases because it didn't matter what gas you work with, right? As far as its physics are concerned, a gas is a gas is a gas. So that was good for them. We didn't know till later why that was. Um, okay, so these particles are essentially moving independently of one another in, in random motion. They're just... There's lots of space between them, huge amount of space between the gas molecules compared to their size. So that's why when you put two gases together, you always get a solution. But there's room for everybody. Okay. So because the attractive forces between the particles are overcome by this dis these disruptive forces, uh, the particles are free to travel in every direction. They completely fill any container you put them into. Uh, whether it's a vacuum or whether it's already got some gas in there to begin with, uh, once you introduce that gas, it expands to fill the volume. It forms a perfect homogeneous solution if there are two or more of them, two or more gases together. And they have very, very low density. Because the particles are widely separated, that's due to their kinetic energy. Very, very high kinetic energy. And there are very few particles in a given volume relative to a solid or a liquid. Right? There's still billions and billions of them here. Right? I take a deep breath. I've sucked in probably a couple of trillion molecules. But it's still less than if I tried to suck in a liquid. I wouldn't want to do that, of course, because I'd drown. Swallow a liquid, not into my lungs. Gases have very large compressibility. The reason they do 
is because there's lots of space. You can push these gas molecules together and there's still plenty of space left over. They have a moderate thermal expansion, right? We're going to talk about that eventually, I think, in terms of Charles' law. We haven't mentioned that one yet, have we? The change in volume relative to temperature. So you increase the kinetic energy by changing the temperature. Remember, average kinetic energy is measured by temperature. You increase the temperature, you're making them strike their, the walls of the container with greater force. And if the container will expand, if it's a like a balloon, or if it's a cylinder with a piston in it, then as you increase the temperature, then the piston will rise or the balloon will expand because the walls are being struck with greater force as we increase the temperature. That gas is liquids and solids. Oh, goody. We are going to get to the gas laws. <laughs> okay. Now, that was the theory behind everything we're going to see from now on. Right, when we look at these gas laws, think about why the gas law works. Right? We kind of got it backwards, right? Usually the laws are developed first, and then we develop a theory later to explain the laws. But the way the authors presented this material, they did the, the theory first. I hope that doesn't give you any trouble. All right, gas laws. Like I said, these started coming around about middle of the 17th century. And the gas laws, uh, let me see. Let me look at my hard copy. Well, we got a hard copy too. You can see what's coming. Okay. Yeah, good. We take them in order. Um, chronological order. The gas laws developed um, in conjunction with the development of technology. Uh, coming out of the Middle Ages, uh, modern, the first modern scientists were uh, able to measure volume reliably. Those, those technologies were, were there. They were also, they, but they needed a way to measure pressure. So they got that one first. Then there, a reliable measure of temperature came along afterwards. So another gas law developed based on that. And then they needed a, a whole new concept. And um, th that was the, the mold. Okay, so let's take them in order. Remember that a law says this is what happens under these circumstances. It makes no attempt to explain why. We've already covered the why. Okay, we need an expression for pressure. Right? Volume's easy. We got that well in hand. We need an expression for pressure. Well, pressure is um, in a mathematical form is simply force per unit area. So what kind of property is pressure? Extensive or intensive? Not a clue. <laughs> Whenever you see a ratio of two variables, think intensive. Why? Because if the force goes up, in order for this to be constant, if that goes up, area's got to go up. And what that means that the amount of whatever can change, but if the pressure is constant, the other one's got to change too. Right? Intensive properties don't change with the amount of substance. Okay, so um, if we use 
the uh, international units, the system, international system units. Right? Force is the new in honor of you know who, Isaac. Area would have to be derived from the unit of length, square meter. So a newton per square meter is um, the derivation for pressure. But this right here, one of these per one of those, this is equal to the Pascal. It's one Pascal pressure. Now, the advantage to the international system is that all these units are interconverted. You can, you can convert them as long as you know how they're constructed. If you have one Pascal, if you want to put that into a calculation and do some canceling of units and, and come out with something recognizable on the other end, you got to know that one Pascal is equal to one Newton per square meter. Okay. But the Newton is a derived unit also. And it's derived from Newton's second law of motion. Right. He said that um, force equals mass times acceleration. So a force applied to a given mass will always produce this acceleration. And if you put in the units, if this is force, right, Newton, mass is a kilogram in the international system, and acceleration is what? It's a change of velocity. So, and velocity is meters per second. Correct? Meters per second. But that's only velocity. We want acceleration. Acceleration is a change in velocity. So it's for every second, the velocity changes. So kilogram meter per second squared is equal to a newton. Right? So all I'm doing here is, is trying to impress upon you the fact that the international system is not just a waste of time and effort because we can change we can interconvert all these if we know what they're made of. All right. But for our purposes, we're not going to use the Pascal in calculation. Unless you're asked to convert it to something else. And then you'll need a conversion factor. And it's just like any dimensional analysis you'll ever come across. If you're going to convert from one unit to the next, you need a conversion factor. And a conversion factor... I think way back to the very beginning of the course. Conversion factors are always based upon equalities. Something's equal to something else. So another measure of pressure is the atmosphere. Right? And the atmosphere is uh, equivalent to a certain height of a mercury column in a barometer that was invented by Evangelista Torricelli. Right? All he did was he took this container of mercury, of course, mercury is a liquid, and he took a glass tube, right? and he filled it with mercury all the way up to the top, put his thumb over, and then he inverted it. And uh, stuck it, stuck his hand and the end of it in the marker. And he pulled his hand loose. And when he did that, he had an inverted column like this, a little straighter. And it was full when he pulled his thumb off of it. But what happened? It dropped. Dropped down here. So what we have here is the first vacuum. Right? A vacuum, by definition, is something's there, now it's not. Right? There's nothing in that space. Of course, we know that there are a few mercury molecules or atoms in there. Mercury is somewhat volatile. But for all intents and purposes, that was a vacuum. And this column of mercury at sea level is going to be 760 millimeters high. From the surface of the mercury to that point, 760 millimeters. That's one atmosphere. When they take your blood pressure, right? Does everybody know what their normal blood pressure is? Mine's about 135 over 85. It's a little up. Low. Mine used to be really low. Is it in the neighborhood of 105 over 60? 
Yeah. Yeah. Mine used to be real low uh, with age and, and weight. It's, it's climbing. But what do those numbers mean? All right, let's use mine. Uh, 135 over 85. What do those numbers mean? Well, this is the systolic pressure, right? When, you're, when your heart goes like that, that's the pressure you get. When it relaxes, that's the pressure you get. But what are the units? They never tell you that, right? The units are in millimeters of mercury. Now, if your doctor still has an old office with uh, a uh, spigmo manometer plastered to the wall, right, and it's got a mercury column in it, that's the old-fashioned way. You had to get up, you had to, this, your chair had to be close to that device for them to wrap that thing around your arm, and it didn't have Velcro on it either. And they pump it up and apply an opposing pressure to, to your um, brachial artery. So when your heart pumps hard, it makes the artery do this and pushes against the, the airbag inside that cuff. Okay, that's how they get the, the indication of what the pressure is inside the vessel. And then, of course, you pump it all the way up and then you put a stethoscope down here and you listen for the sounds, the Karatkov sounds. There are five of them. Um, usually only you pay attention to the, the first one and the last one. The first one, when you first hear that sound, that gives you the high. When it's when it finally disappears, that gives you the low. <clears throat> but it, it's in millimeters of mercury, and it's based upon that, the barometer. It's a modification of the barometer. It it effectively it takes this and it seals it off from the atmosphere. Right? And it goes over to the cuff. Okay, so when you pressurize this space, it it puffs up the cuff, and it also puts pressure on the mercury, and it drives this mercury column up. Okay, so a manometer is a barometer that's designed to measure the pressure of gas in a trapped cylinder, and a sphygmo manometer is a modification of that, so that you can determine the pressure in that cuff against your arm. Or um, if you're a cat, maybe they put it on your tail. Right? I used to have, I had a cat with uh, uh, problems. <laughs> so they, uh, they measured her blood pressure by putting a, a small cuff on her tail. You have to shave it, and then you put the cuff on the tail, and they can measure the blood pressure from the tail. Uh, she had lots of problems. She had uh, glaucoma like you would not believe. They used a, a, one of those puff pressure things that you can get the eye doctors does. Instead of using the device that comes in here and pokes your eye, they use the puffs of air. Have you ever had that done at the eye doctor? Yeah, okay. at least one person has. <clears throat> well, they did that with, with this cat. And you could see there was lots of pressure in there because her eye was bulging. It was so high, um, they got an error message on their device. It was too high to measure. So we put her on, on drops and got the pressure down. And then we could finally measure it. And it was still pretty high. Um, anyway, uh, where was I? One atmosphere equals 760 millimeters of mercury. If we use the imperial system, the English system, um, how do you measure pressure in your tires? Pounds per square inch, right? Now, if you use a device like this one right here, right, it's going it's got a scale on it in PSI, pounds per square inch. Well, it also has bar and it has kilopascals. So a thousand, thousand pascals is a kilopascal. So it's got all, it's got different, uh, measurements but one atmosphere equals 14.7 pounds per square inch okay so we've got all these different measurements 
And remember, if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C. So if this is equal to that, it's also equal to that, then this is equal to that, that's equal to, I mean, and then Pascal has a different, uh, I'm not sure if they're going to tell you that one or not. Uh, no, they're not. They're going to tell you, maybe later. And maybe in, in uh, one of the problems, it'll have an equivalent to uh, one atmosphere equals so many pascals. Actually, I think it's 101.6 kilopascals or 101,600 pascals is one atmosphere. So this uh, pressure of the gas is a measure of those molecules inside the container smacking against the walls of the container. And if you put a gauge in there, of course, they're going to hit the gauge, too. Now, uh, if they didn't do that and you put a gauge in there, it would just read zero. Right? So that's evidence for the kinetic molecular theory being somewhat correct. All right, so there's uh, Torricelli's barometer. Now, he used mercury because mercury is, is dense. It's a dense liquid. In fact, it's, it's the only um, metal that's a liquid at room temperature. We've got one gas, I mean, one uh, non-metal that's a liquid at room temperature. Remember which that one was? You did, who did the extra credit of where you had to uh, build your periodic table. Okay. And you had to identify the two liquids, didn't you? Okay. What's the other one? Don't remember? <laughs> Bromine. Bromine's a liquid. Mercury's a liquid. Okay. So uh, why did he choose mercury? Well, mercury was, was commonly available. I mean, it was relatively cheap. But, and so was water. Right. He could have used water. Right? Any liquid will do. I don't know if he did it by calculation or if he tried and found that it didn't work. But how long would the tube have to be at one atmosphere of pressure at sea level right, to use water? It would be about 33 feet long. Right? Anybody in here scuba diver? Or you, you got a friend or family that's scuba? Okay. Every scuba diver knows that as you descend, every 33 feet is another atmosphere pressure on your body. That's roughly speaking because seawater is different density than fresh water, but it's a good estimate. So uh, who needs a 33 foot long barometer tube, right? So he went to mercury, which has a specific gravity of 13.6. So it's 13.6 times the density of water. That means you can use a smaller tube, a shorter tube, and get the same effect. Now, I made a, a barometer using water one time. I just, it was really easy. But the reason I used water is because I was measuring the, the suction in a carburetor. So I hooked the tube up to the carburetor to measure the suction. And since it's, it's a lot smaller, right, than one atmosphere, uh, the water column moved a certain distance. And I could tell, you know, if I was getting the right draft through my carburetor. That's when we used carburetors, right? We don't use them anymore, correct? They're all fuel injectors now. <laughs> okay. Uh, the four variables involved in gas laws. All right, we didn't mention that before. Um, if you want to completely describe the... The physics of gases, you need to know four factors. You need to know pressure, volume, temperature, and the number of particles. That's my little n. It stands for moles. And if you know all four of those, you can completely describe the physical behavior of a gas. And if you want uh, to study two of these variables and see how they behave relative to one another, then you have to hold the other two constant. Okay, I'll mention that 
in just a minute. Again, in just a minute with Boyle's Law. All right. So here's Boyle's Law. How are we doing on? It's after 11. Oh, I think we might be able to finish this. Uh, let's see. I'm going to erase that. Make room for Boyle's Law. Robert Boyle. He was an Englishman. Here we go. Robert Boyle investigated the behavior of gases relative to these two right here, pressure and volume. So that means the gas that he was uh, investigating, whatever it had to be, usually air, these had to be constant. Okay, temperature and moles had to be constant. Once you've got a certain amount of gas trapped in your device, you can't change the amount. And once it's in there, you can't change the temperature either. Okay, so what Robert Boyle did was he took one of those long tubes that Torricelli was using and he just bent it into a J-tube. Okay, so it looks something like this. Uh, let's see, like that, like that, and that end is closed and this end is open. Okay, so he just put mercury in it. And when you started putting mercury in it, it pooled up in the bottom, of course, right? Got a little pool at the bottom here. Then he put more, and it pooled up a little more. When you put enough in it that it touched the inner curve, this gas now is trapped. And this one, that means it's constant, because there's no way in and no way out. Okay? How about temperature? How did he keep temperature constant? Well, these experiments that he was doing here um, took just a few minutes. So uh, out on the bench top, temperature's not going to change. I mean, if you really want to, you can make an ice water bath. Right? As long as you've got ice, solid ice, and water together in the bath, and there's always solid, there's always liquid, the temperature is going to be the freezing point of water constant. So you can do it that way if you want. Um, but what he also noticed was, as he added more mercury, right, and say he added enough to reach up to here, right, expecting to do this over here? Nope. It only went up to here. Okay. So, What's pressing here? This is the difference here in height between that and that. This difference in height is a measure in, in millimeters of mercury of the pressure that's on that gas. In addition to atmospheric pressure. So the total pressure on that gas is whatever the atmospheric pressure was plus this difference in, in mercury this distance here okay so he had to have a barometer sitting on the desk next to it to determine what that was and then that he would add to this and that's the pressure on the gas okay and he noticed well what does this mean right why would there be a pressure right if this is is up that high what's keeping it there Think it kinetically. You got molecules in here banging up against each other, banging against the mercury. And as you as you try to force them into smaller volume, you've got more impacts per unit area. Uh, you're squeezing them into a smaller volume, which means surface area is smaller. But if they're at the same temperature, they've got the same kinetic energy as they had before but there are more of them impacting the surface per unit area than there were before. So that's the expression of pressure. As you try to compress them further, they fight back more. 
because you're pushing them into a smaller uh, volume. All right. All right. So as he added more mercury, he found that it did increase some, but not a lot. And the difference in the height here is an expression of pressure on that gas. So he could set up a table, right? Pressure versus volume. And he can measure volume, volume relative to height, right? Because these tubes were uniform form diameter. What's the volume of a cylinder? Height times area, right? Yeah, think, think way back to the math class. Height times area is the volume of the cylinder. So if, if the area is constant, then the air, the volume is proportional to the height. So he could just put height values in here for volume. And pressure is relative to the height of the mercury column. He could put height in here of the mercury column. Right? So he'd have this list. So as the pressure goes up, the volume goes down. And that's why the expression is pressure times volume is a constant. Okay. Whenever you see two variables as products, product of two variables equals a constant, this is an inverse proportion. That means for this to be constant, if one of them goes up, the other one has to go down. All right? But that's not very useful. Right? How are we going to solve problems with that? Well, as long as the conditions don't change, then you've got a certain pressure here at this position times the volume at that position is equal to a constant. But if you change the pressure and you get a different volume, that's also going to be, uh, excuse me, that's also going to be equal to that same constant, right? So here we go again. A equals B and B equals C, so A equals C. That's why P1V1 is equal to P2V2, right, right there. So what that means for problem solving, say you know the pressure and the volume under one set of conditions, and say you increase the pressure to this value. Right, so you know that one, you know that one, you know this one, and you don't need the constant anymore because they're equal to each other. And this one's your unknown. Right, what have I said from the beginning? Any equation in one unknown is solvable. So if you know three of these, you can solve the other one. The key to using these types of formulas is be sure you put your numbers in the right place. So when you read a word problem, you ought to set up a chart. And you say, all right, which one belongs with which one? All right, I got this one. I got that one. I got that one. That's my unknown. Then you put these where they're supposed to be and solve for that one. That way, you don't plug the numbers into the wrong place and get the wrong answer. All right, that's Boyle's Law. Oh, they're going to illustrate. Right. <clears throat> so if you if you double the pressure, you should cut the volume in half. That's all that's saying. All right. So there's our that's typically the way we express Boyle's law. But uh, we can solve this equation for any contingency. Right. If I'm solving for this one. I just keep this one on that side and put P2, V2 over P1. And the, the only other condition is the units of, if you know this one and you know that one, they have to be the same units. Right? If it's atmospheres, atmospheres, great. They cancel out anyway. And then whatever volume units is, is the answer that you're going to get here. All right.
Oh, we got an example. All right. Let's work a problem. Um, leave that one there. All right. A sample of helium gas. Actually, it doesn't matter what the gas is. In this case, it's helium. Occupies 12.4 liters at 23 degrees and 0 0.56 atmospheres. Right. So they're saying the first volume measurement is 12.4 liters. And the first pressure measurement is 0 0.956 atmospheres. How about temperature? Does that matter? As long as the temperature doesn't change, it doesn't matter. At 23 degrees, what volume will it occupy at 1.20 atmospheres, assuming the temperature stays constant? So we don't even have to mess with temperature because it doesn't change. But how about this one and this one? Which one's which? I call this type of problem a before and after. You know the conditions before, you know some of the conditions after, then you can solve them. 1.20 atmospheres. 1.20 atmospheres. Okay, so that's our unknown right there, V2. So if we solve this for V2, then that's P1, V1 over P2. Right? And all we have to do is plug in the numbers. Right? 0 0.956. I'm going to leave the units out just for brevity's sake. We know that they're right. Atmosphere, atmosphere, liters. This one's going to be in liters then. Uh, volume 1 is 12.4 liters. And pressure, 1.20 atmospheres. So what's going to be the answer? So tell me. Yep. 9.88 liters. Now, is that kosher? Yeah. This is a multiply divide rule. Three, three, three. Significant figures, three in the answer. Okay. Now, you can do it that way. You can solve for the unknown first, or you can just plug the values in and then solve for your unknown. It doesn't matter, really. Whichever you're more comfortable with. Okay. Now, let's... Moving on, historically speaking. Our thermometer was developed. And um, we're going to, particularly, we're going to focus on Celsius. The Celsius temperature scale, we've done uh, thermometers, haven't we? Yeah, okay. The Celsius scale was developed for physical and chemical. Uh, situations. So that's the appropriate one for us. And Charles, Charles, I think he was French. Anyway, Charles came after Boyle's because uh, it wasn't until they could develop a reliable system for measuring temperature that Charles could investigate. And so what he did was he wanted to investigate volume changes with temperature. So that means pressure had to be constant and moles had to be constant. So how do you do that? Well, one way is to get a cylinder and have a piston in it. And you put a, a certain mass on top. That's just for argument's sake, let's make it one kilogram. Right, so it's, it's going to be the same force here all the time and you trap a certain amount of gas in here and you don't have any way to get in or out so you got a good seal here and there are no ports here to introduce more or subtract any so we've got our constant pressure we've got our constant moles and now we need to control the temperature so one way to control the temperature is just put it in a bath like you can make it an ice bath or you could uh, water bath and you could heat it up gradually. Right? Uh, but you need to change the temperature and then measure the volume. So you have this is calibrated somehow to measure the volume. All right. So once you've got those values, then you can draw a graph. Uh, I forgot to draw a boil plot. Right? We did that already, though, right? with the uh, graphing techniques.
right? Pressure volume. So we change the pressure, so that's X, and V is the response. And you always get a hyperbola. All right, so um, Charles did the same thing, except his was he changed the temperature, right? That's X axis, and measured the volume. And what did he get? Well, he got, he got a straight line. Yeah. So as the temperature goes up, the volume goes up. As long as the pressure is constant and the moles are constant. So what that means is volume divided by temperature is a constant. So whenever you see a, a quotient, not a product, but a quotient of two variables equals a constant, you have a direct proportionality. Right? And you'll have a positive slope. I didn't mention that earlier, but with uh, pressure times volume, pressure times volume equals constant, that's a negative slope. So pressure times volume is like this. Anywhere on that curve, the, li the line tangent to that curve is negative slope. Um, okay. So under these circumstances, that one's equal to a constant, but if you change the temperature, then you're going to get a different volume. But it's still equal to that constant. So V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. That's where that formula comes from. Um, there's a nut, there's a fly in the ointment though. The problem, you can graph your stuff like this, right? But what if your temperature on the Celsius scale goes, these are all positives. These are all negatives. You can go negative with the Celsius scale, right? But you could go down there like that. What happens to your formula? If you go negative on the temperature, it's not equal to that constant anymore because now it's negative. So we need a temperature scale that is always positive, and that's Kelvin. Lord Kelvin developed this scale. He just extended that line down here, and this now is 0K. Well, it also happens to be minus 273 C. So every measurement, every value of K is positive. Problem solved. You just have to remember that when you're, when you're working these gas laws, temperature must always be Kelvin. All right. So what's the uh, kinetic explanation? When you increase the temperature, you're increasing Kinetic energy, average kinetic energy of all the particles. So what are they doing? Well, as you increase kinetic energy, they're smacking into that thing and they're smacking into the walls with greater force. You increase the force and it, it presses against, with greater force than before, presses against this force that's bearing down on it until they're equal again. Right? Once you expand the gas out to where they're equal, with expanding the volume, then the number of impacts per unit area is back to where it was before you changed the temperature. So the volume must increase as you increase the temperature in order to accommodate those kinetic relationships. All right. Uh, let's see, Miss Charles Long. All right, so here's a problem. Um, oh, it uses a balloon. So this diagram is not going to work. So we've got a balloon containing 1.3 liters of air at 24.7 degrees Celsius. It's placed into a beaker containing liquid nitrogen. Okay, so the first uh, volume, V1, equals... 1.3 liters at what temperature? 
24.7 degrees C. All right? So what's going to change? It looks like the temperature is changing, and the question is, what's the new volume? So the temperature now is minus 78.5 degrees C. All right. Uh, minus 78.5 degrees is not cold enough for liquid nitrogen. So it must be in the vapor above the liquid nitrogen. I know for a fact that liquid nitrogen is minus 195 degrees C. But that's neither here nor there. This is the second temperature, right? If we're going to use temperature, what do we have to do to it? We have to convert it. It's got to be Kelvin. Right? Uh, some, some books uh, add decimals on the end here, like 273.15 or 16. And you can do that. Um, usually for the, our calculations, 273 is good enough. So if we set it up like that, right, we know that V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. And we put V1 in there at 1.3 liters divided by T1. Uh, let's see, what would that be? That would be 7. 7. 9. 297 K, and that's equal to V2, which is our unknown, and then T2, which is, uh, we got to subtract that one. Five, eight from 12 is four, and seven from 16 is nine, 195 K. All right, so then we solve for V2, and we should get 0 0.849 liters. Okay. All right. Um, let me see. We're missing one of the laws. I thought I snuck it in here. I'm going to give it to you anyway. Because this one is probably, as far as chemistry goes, the next law is probably more important than the other two put together. This one is called Avogadro's law. Amadeo Avogadro, he was an Italian. And uh, he and several other people were working. Actually, uh, Avogadro's law is not is not all. He, Avogadro can't claim everything about this law himself. He was honored with the name for this law, <clears throat> but his concepts did uh, fashion it in such a way that it was useful. And Avogadro was interested in volume and moles. So temperature had to be constant and pressure had to be constant. But what he discovered was that as um, you add more particles, you get a higher volume. So that means that they're directly proportional. Volume divided by moles is constant. And we can also do it this way, volume two over N2, that, and solve problems that way. Actually, Avogadro, I, I like a different way of expressing Avogadro's law. What Avogadro said, and I may have given you this before, and then that uh, two volumes of equal size gases. Wait. 
Use your imagination. <laughs> volume one equals volume two. And we got a gas in, in each one of them. It doesn't have to be the same gas either. Doesn't matter. If the temperatures are the same and the pressures are the same inside, then the number of moles of each gas must be exactly the same. The number of particles of this one has to be equal to that one. <clears throat> That's where Avogadro excelled. See, the problem was, uh, this was in the mid-1800s. Um, college professors and, and company chemists were running into process problems. They were making money hand over fist um, in the chemical industry, particularly in Germany. But when the process went wrong, everything they tried failed. They couldn't get it to be right because they didn't understand the nature of chemical reactions. We know chemical reactions now are based upon numbers of reactants, not mass numbers and all they had to go on in the 1800s was mass i know we put in a mass of this reactant and mass of that reactant and, I, and we get these two masses out or whatever right and that was an incomplete understanding of of the chemical process when avogadro came along now they were able to equate numbers of particles and they had a way of determining the mass of a mole of something this was an avenue to determining molar mass of all the substances. Because if we've got the same number of particles of this gas here and the same number of particles of this gas here, but they've got different masses, right? Mass one is not equal to mass two. Why is that? The reason the mass is different is because the individual particles are different masses. So now we had a way of relatively determining, uh, if we could determine the, the mass of a mole of this particle, and compared to this one, now we had a way to say, all right, this one must be, right, if this one's 10 uh, grams per mole, and we got uh, the same number of particles over here, but we've got twice the mass, then it must be 20 grams per mole. You know, that type of thing. That's why Avogadro is actually more important than the others combined. Okay. Now we get to the combined gas law. Because sometimes you can't hold all of these constants to do your calculation. Sometimes you know before and after, and the befores and afters are all different, right? These things are all over the place. So we need to build a combined gas law. So we put it all together and let everything vary. So we start with Boyle's law. Boyle's law says P V one equals P two V two, right? But we also know uh, from Charles that V one over T one equals V two over T two, don't we? So uh, ah, not V T T one and T two. So that's where they got that combined gas law right there. But that doesn't include the number of moles. So what's the ratio of volume and moles? Well, they're directly proportional, right? So N1 here and N2 here, that is the complete combined gas law right there. So you're probably thinking, why don't you just fix this slide set? <laughs> you didn't have to do that. Yeah, you're right. I need to go back and and, and tweak these uh, slides so that I don't have to digress. All right. So, uh, using the combined gas law, and in this case, uh, they they've got a, a gas uh, at a temperature. At uh, some temperature, and we've got 121 milliliters of CO2 at 27 degrees and one at 1.05 atmospheres. 
what at what temperature will it occupy 293 milliliters and a pressure of 1.4 atmospheres right so if the gas is trapped if you know this gas law then you ask yourself based upon the word problem are any of these constant right if they're constant then you can eliminate that factor and in this case the gas is trapped uh, and it's not undergoing any kind of reaction. So we can eliminate moles. And now you're back to the one that was in that previous slide. But what we need to do now is be sure that we've got everything in its proper position. Okay. All right. What's the before condition? P The, the ones. P1, V1, T1. Uh, 121 milliliters right here. Okay. What's uh, temperature? The starting temperature is 27 degrees plus 273. Right? You might as well do it now. Uh, and one atmosphere pressure, 105 atmospheres. All right. What's the what's the after? That was the, the before. What's the after? 293 milliliters. and 1.4 atmosphere pressure. And the question is, what temperature would give us that value? All right, so now that we've got everything in its proper place, we can plug it into the formula and solve it. This is the thinking part. That's number crunching. All right, so if we do that, we end up with 969K. But if we want the value in degrees Celsius, we need to subtract 273 from it, don't we? So that's why the value now is 696. 696 degrees C. So if you're confronted with a problem like this on an exam, um, most of my exams are multiple choice, so just look at the answers. Right. See, see what the units of measure are. So you can solve the problem for this, but that's not among your answers because it's the wrong units. All right. Now, that was the, these are all before and after situations for problem solving. What if um, you only know the current state of the system? How are you going to solve that problem? You don't know before. You only know what it is right now. Well, we've got a solution for that. And let me let me redraw this part of it over here. Right. These two, because they were equal to each other, they have to be equal to a constant. That's the only way that they can be equal. Okay, so being equal to a constant, um, if we put it in a linear format, right, we bring these two factors over here. Um, yeah, bring these two factors over here. I'm going to drop the ones. Just pressure times volume equals this K times number of moles times temperature. Okay, now we have a linear format. <clears throat> If we know the value of K, and we also know three of these others, we can solve for the fourth. So what we have to do is find out what is K equal to. Well, in order to do that, we just need to, to investigate the units of measure. If we say that pressure is one atmosphere, but we just say standard temperature and pressure. Standard pressure would be one atmosphere. Standard temperature would be um, K, right? Standard temperature is zero degrees for gases. So it'd be 273 K, wouldn't it? And if we let it be just one mole. So we got one mole at zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere pressure, what volume does it occupy? Right, you have to measure that. The volume, in fact, is 22.4 liters. 
Now that we know these values, if we put um, one atmosphere, 22.4 liters, divided by 273K in one mole, then we get a value. Let me see if I did that right. I know what the value is supposed to be, but I want to be sure. 22.4 and divide by 273. Yeah. Zero. Zero. Point oh eight two oh six. Now, what are the units? Well, it's got to be liter atmospheres. Remember, when you do something to numbers, you got to do the same calculations to the units. So we're going to multiply liters times atmospheres in the numerator. And in the denominator, we've got um, per mole K. Those are the units of the constant. And if we use these values and we use this formula, then we give K a special symbol. That's R. That's the ideal gas constant. So now we can write it this way, PV equals NRT. That's the way you'll usually see it. Now they've got uh, 0821. I strung it out a little further, 8206. They just rounded it to one. Okay. I like this one better. All right. So now, uh, if we just know the state of the situation, the present state, uh, we got an example. Well, no, there. There it is. There's our example. You can tell that this is a state. It's not a before and after because it only gives you one temperature, one volume, one pressure, and it asks you how many moles. Okay, that's how you tell if it's the difference between before and after. There's no before. <laughs> There's only an after. That means you need to use that formula, okay? So in this case, let's see. Now that, um, that R value, it's only good for these units of measure. So when you use it, you have to be sure that your pressure, volume, moles, and temperature are all uh, in these units, okay? If you don't, then you can't use the formula. But actually, you can't use that constant. All right, so 23 degrees, we'd have to change that to what? 273? 273. So it'd be 296. 296K. 25 liters, that's good. 2.18 atmospheres, that's good. Now calculate the moles. All right, so we plug it in, solve for the moles. That means this automobile tire, under those conditions, has 2.24 moles of gas in it. Impress your friends at parties. Ask them if they know how many moles of air in their tires. Now, we normally, like uh, the tires on my new vehicle, they run at 36 PSI. So, how do we use that formula? We'd have to convert 36 PSI to atmospheres. Right? PSI on the bottom, cancel, and then atmospheres on top. Right? One atmosphere is 14.7 PSI. So, that would give you atmospheres. Most vehicles now have uh, uh, have those have uh, uh, that screen, little TV screen in the center of your dash, and and uh, lots of them. Uh, mine does. It has a uh, has a screen behind the steering wheel, and you can you can move through different screens. And I've got one that that gives me uh, uh, a picture of uh, the four wheels, right? Uh, tire pressures, right? They got those. Really expensive <laughs> uh, things that go in your each wheel, <clears throat> and they send information to the car's computer, 
and tell you what your pressure is. Well, I've noticed as I drive, right, the tires heat up and the pressure goes up. All right. Or when I get into my car early in the morning, I drive for a mile or so and it reads it again. Uh, on these mornings, the pressure is down. Right. So it's responding. Pressure is responding to temperature change. All right. What's the pressure in a 304 liter tank that contains 5.670 kilograms of helium at 25? All right. In this case, knowing that it's helium is absolutely essential. Because we know the volume, we know the temperature, we only know the mass of helium. We gotta know the moles before we calculate the pressure. So you've gotta take 5.670 kilograms, convert it to grams, and use molar mass to determine how many moles of helium that is. I think I do that here. Uh, I do it all in one step. All right, so this first one right here, PV equals NRT. So we know the volume here. This is the moles. 5.6 kilograms times 1,000 is grams. Divided by the molar mass of helium. Okay. Then there's our gas constant. And there's our temperature in Kelvin. Right. So we had to be sure that our units were proper. Right? Kilograms of helium won't get it. You need moles. So that tank has 114 atmospheres, which is really high. I'm not sure how many, how many PSI is that? Right. 1,676 PSI. Actually, I've seen them higher than that. We used to get tanks of gas. You've seen the big tanks that sit up here like this? They'll run 2,500 PSI easy. Some of them 3,000, 4,000 PSI. Right, so you got to be careful. Right? Have you ever seen a, a movie uh, where, they, where they position the cylinder on its side and there's a cinder block wall over there and they have this device, big heavy device that comes down and knocks the top off of it. Right? And they're standing back behind a protective barrier. <laughs> when you do that, that cylinder goes through that wall. So if you're in a, in a lab situation where you've got tanks, be sure that they're secured. They strapped to something, to the desk, to the wall, whatever. Because if one of them falls and knocks that top off, it is going flying. I mean, even if it's half full, it's still got enough energy in it to take off and it'll go through you. All right. Now we come to John Dalton. Remember John Dalton? The atomic theory? That wasn't the only thing he was working on. He was playing with gases like everybody else in his day and time. What John Dalton <laughs> is proposing with this law, partial pressures. I look at that and say, okay, Dalton made it and it's a law so that we don't know why. Uh, but this is the meat right here, partial pressures. His law of partial pressure simply says that when you measure the pressure of a mixture of gases in a container, that total pressure is the summation of the individual pressures of each of the gases in there. Right? If you put the, each one of those gases into a cylinder under exactly the same conditions, separate cylinders, and measure their pressures, then you could add those pressures together, put them in a cylinder of the same size that they came from, all the same volume. And you could add them up and you could determine their total pressure, the pressure inside that vessel. So mathematically speaking, the total pressure of any combination of gases is due to the summation of each of the individual pressures of the gases up to, doesn't matter how many, sky's the limit. Now, why does that matter? Well, well, there's there's the illustration that I just gave you, right? So um, P 
the pressure one is one atmosphere, the pressure uh, B is three, C is two, add them all together, total is six. So we got a gas mixture consisting of oxygen, helium, and nitrogen. Right? How do I write oxygen? O two. Remember, it's a diatomic gas. You got to know that. If you don't know that, then you can't solve the problem. Yeah, maybe you can in this case, but you can't do any chemistry with it. Uh, what's the other one? Helium, right? Helium, right? Noble gases. Right? They're all single atoms. And nitrogen, which is another diatomic. All right. A total pressure of 780 millimeters of mercury. Okay. What's the partial pressure of oxygen? Right. We want to know this one. As long if we know that helium is, uh, let's see, helium and nitrogen, 86 and 124, respectively. So this one's 86, and this one's 124 millimeters of mercury. So if we make this one the unknown, partial pressure of oxygen plus pressure of helium plus the pressure of nitrogen, right? then we can put values in here, 86 for that one, 124 for that one. We have one unknown. We can solve for it. All right? So it would be this one. Minus 86, minus 124. That would be the partial pressure of oxygen. And if we do our math right, it's 570 millimeters of mercury. As long as you account for every gas that's in there. I mean, if you're missing a gas, then you're going to come up short. It needs a refill. All right. How about... Oh, 12. Okay, we're good. How about this problem? You know, I might have to stop where I, uh, uh, where I said in the syllabus. We've got this problem. Uh, two cylinders containing gas. Uh, this one's a big one. And they're connected with a valve. And this one's a small one. Right. This one is three liters. This one is nine liters. This one's at a pressure of two atmospheres. And this one's at a pressure of three atmospheres. OK. What we want to do is determine what's the, the pressure when we open that valve and let them mix. This happens at 45 degrees. Uh, okay, it doesn't matter what the gas is. They say it's helium at 45 degrees. As long as the temperature is constant, then we can do this. All right. Uh, in, let's look at it intuitively first. Which way is the pressure going to go? If this one's at two atmospheres and this one's at three, where is it going to end up? Qualitatively speaking. It's going to be between two and three, isn't it? Right? You can't put two together with three and get more than three or less than two. Right? It's going to be between two and three total pressure. But how do we get there? All right. What we have to do is separate these two in our minds and in calculations and say, all right, suppose this side is evacuated. There's nothing in there. And we open the valve. What's going to happen? Well, we can solve that problem with Boyle's law, right? Pressure volume before, pressure volume after. And that gives us the pressure of that gas, partial pressure of that gas in the whole volume. Then we could do the same. Make that a vacuum and let this one expand. And that gives the partial pressure of that gas in this total volume. What's the total volume? I mean, total pressure. It's the result of the first one plus the result of the second one. They're partial pressures. Right? So we're going to use Boyle's law and Dalton's law to solve this problem.
Let's see. Has it worked out? You probably you guys have looked ahead. You probably know. Yeah, there we go. So the final volume is going to be 12 liters for both scenarios. The initial volume for the first one, of course, is going to be nine liters. So the first one is going to be starting off at two atmospheres and nine liters. We're going to end up at 12 liters and a pressure. So we can we can uh, P1 over P1 V1 equals P2 V2 and solve for the final pressure. So if we stick, if we solve for the final, put the values in there in their proper place, we know that 1.5 atmospheres results from this gas in that volume. And if we do the same thing for the other side, with the same final volume, but a different pressure, we find that that's 0.75 atmospheres for this side. The total pressure is just the summation, 2.25. So it is between two and three, okay? There's your answer. Fill that. Don't have enough time to 